Sound familiar? Okay. Let us pick up. So the last of four. Uh, this is our last major grouping um, of the four that we had. Um, cytoskeleton, right? So when you take a look at the cytoskeleton, what you've got basically is the, the framework or the structure, the scaffold um, that basically gives the cell its structure. Um, and so it's basically composed of a series of different types of proteins. Um, all of them are fibrous in nature. So very much kind of like a scaffolding system is what the cytoskeleton looks like. And basically some components of the cytoskeleton are dynamic and some are static. Um, and so just like any time, a lot of times you kind of have a trade-off between two different things, right? So where you can be either very static in nature, but if you're gonna be static, you have to give up on the dynamic nature of things. If you're gonna be dynamic, you can't be static, right? So you're gonna to have to pick one, pick a horse and ride it. And so the different pieces of the cytoskeleton will actually uh, waver between those two. And you'll kind of see that you have components of both. And so there is a sort of dynamic component of it where you can kind of disassemble and assemble and disassemble and assemble. And uh, in all cases, the cytoskeleton really does uh, revolve around support and locomotion. Those are the two biggies that the cytoskeleton does for you. Right, the support part makes sense, right? Because we are familiar with the skeleton, our own skeleton keeps us upright um, and keeps us moving forward. And it's also important for locomotion, right? Because after all, if you didn't have legs for the purpose of locomotion, then you wouldn't get very far, right? So our skeleton actually gets us a lot of locomotion support. So we kind of intuitively have a sense of some of the role that the side of skeleton already plays. And it's also an anchoring, right? Sort of kind of creates anchorage as well. So kind of a backdrop on which you can sort of tack, if you will, your organelles so that they're not just kind of all loosey goosey sort of all over the place, right? So it's a little difficult to do business if basically the people or the organelles you're trying to do business with are basically moving targets, right? So that's always gonna be a little difficult. This way you know where to expect things, okay? And so all of that is part of um, the system. Now there's three major fibers and we've put this on the outline that I kind of sketched out very frantically before um, of the cytoskeleton. These are not listed the way I listed them. I listed them in order of size. These are listed, I don't know what order this is, but it's a different order. Um, but the first one that you're gonna get into is what's called the actin or the microfilaments. So the actin filaments are composed of a protein called actin and the protein itself will form kind of a long linear chain of little actin subunits. And each of these subunits, if you just kind of pull together previous chapters are all folded together in tertiary structure. So they kind of got that globular look to them. There's not just one, there's actually two chains of actin. They kind of wind around each other. Into the sort of uh, two-fold threaded um, kind of actin chain. And so what actin tends to do, there's three major things that actin tends to do. We're gonna talk a little bit about them. We're not gonna really talk about the first one because that's the realm of AMP1. So if you get an AMP1, when you get to the muscle physiology chapter, you'll be talking a lot about contraction because in contraction, muscle contraction in particular, um, actin is a major protein fiber that makes up muscle mass. And a lot of your muscle mass is actually made out of actin. Uh, and it's a key component to that contraction. So in order to get a muscle to work, it has to contract, so it shortens. And then when it shortens, basically it creates um, load and, um, and, uh, and that's your contraction piece. So that's an AMP1 thing, but the other two are types of movements. So these are actually just kind of local movements, just small movements, basically within the cell. So one is crawling. So basically kind of uh, the cell just sort of oozes along uh, like a little blob. So this crawling is oftentimes referred to as amoeboid movement, because amoeba move by this kind of crawling mechanism. We'll talk a, a little bit about that mechanism a little later on, but then it's also pinching, right? So for instance, a cell can sort of create these little, like little pincher fingers, and it can kind of just basically kind of pinch on stuff like that. And so those are all very small, just like little movements of the cell. They're all driven by active dynamics. This is an actual, 
uh, type part of the skeleton side of skeleton that's actually a dynamic process. So that's to say you can you can build actin networks and you can break them down and you can rebuild them and break them down and rebuild them and break them down. Okay, so they're designed to be dynamic and they're designed to fluctuate in structure. Now the largest one, which is probably like the sexy one, right? The one that everybody like wants to study, like all the biochemists and stuff like that are the microtubules. And the microtubules are large in nature, but they're basically composed of a heterodimer of a protein called tubulin. And there's two different types of tubulin. There's an alpha and there's a beta tubulin. And they come together as a pair. That's a heterodimer, so they're different, but they are two. Uh, so this would be quaternary structure. This would be an example of quaternary structure uh, because they come together as a team. And so the way you build a microtubule, which is basically a big long cylinder of tubulin, is you just basically take these little dimers and you kind of just start stacking them kind of on each other like this. And you just kind of keep stacking them into this like little ring-like structure. And then you kind of keep stacking them back here like this. And then eventually what you're going to create is this long cylinder-like structure, which is a microtubule. So fairly large in nature. But the reason why we like this one is because all the movements of a cell and within a cell are basically going to be driven, a lot of it is going to be driven or um, have a component of it that's involving microtubules. So microtubules are, are kind of the culprit behind a lot of movement um, that's not uh, crawling and pinching, right? So most of your movement is actually devoured up by microtubules. That's kind of covered by microtubules. This is also designed to be a dynamic system. That is to say that you can, because <laughs> all you're doing is just basically stacking tubulin dimers. That's all you're doing to build it. You can easily unstack it, right? So this is like built to be dynamic. So you can extend a microtubule out and you can contract it back in and extend it back out and contract it back in. So because all you're doing is just stacking it all up and just tearing it all down stacking it all up and tearing it all down. So it's very, very dynamic, and it, it, which is good because it's able to sort of nimbly respond to any kind of circumstantial changes or fluctuations in the environment. The last one, and probably the least fascinating of all of them is the intermediate filament, right? So this is basically um, fibers of protein. And it's made of different subunits. So an example <coughs> is a nuclear lamina is made of laminin. But things like hair and nails is made of another intermediate filament, keratin. So we say it's made of different proteins because there's different things that can actually make up a filament. They're not all intermediate filaments are actually designed to be like laminin, right? You're not all nuclear lamina. There's different proteins and, uh, and like keratin, for instance, is a type and there's other types um, as well, but they all have something in common. They basically kind of form these long sort of filamentous fibers, um, very much like steel girders um, in the cell. And so they typically tend to be very stable and they don't get broken down. So they kind of form the scaffold or the scaffolding of the cell. So these are designed to be static. They don't move. So think of it kind of like a tent. Intermediate filaments are sort of like the frame of the tent. The frame of the tent is what gives the tent its shape, right? And so it doesn't change because if it does change then that tent is coming down on your head, right? And so that will always stay static. So it doesn't change because it's like the, literally the framework of the scaffold that creates the shape of the tent itself. Now within that system, as the intermediate filaments are sort of holding everything up and just sort of statically staying there to kind of create that overall, overall structure, then you have things like the microtubules and the actin filaments who will kind of poke at the tent and kind of change the shape of the tent depending on what you're trying to accomplish. But they can do that in a dynamic way. So they can poke it to sort of bulge the tent out. They can pull it all back to sort of let that bulge go. 
And so they can do these different sorts of things, but it's all within the framework of the intermediate filament sort of holding everything up so that these dynamic components of the cytoskeleton can kind of play and squirrel around. Okay. So these ones are, this was to say, these ones are the least sexy, if you will, right? These are not the fascinating ones to study, but these ones are the ones that really are necessary in order to make sure that the other two can do their job. Okay. I don't know very many people who actually study intermediate filaments. Um, I know a lot of people who study microtubules. That's, that's red hot. Okay. And uh, so this is kind of what it looks like. So this is kind of the visual of what you're looking at, right? So here you can see the actin filament, the sort of dual chain of actin basically, that's kind of interwined uh, between each other. And so you're talking about a diameter roughly about seven nanometers. So it's barely on this tiny side, but you can kind of see, and this is really, I like this because you can kind of see inside the cell sort of where positionally it would sort of exist in the cell itself. So you can see these long sort of actin cables that sort of run uh, throughout um, the cell itself. And then you have the microtubules, right? Which are 25 nanometers, so pretty big. Um, and you can see these like little stacks of, of tubulin, right? So light green, dark green to denote the alpha versus the beta tubulin. So you can see it's just a bit long cylinder of this tubulin just kind of all stacked um, in kind of this, this, this uh, sort of directional pattern. And uh, with microtubules, because they're, um, they can grow, you can extend them out very easily. They have a polarity about them. So we kind of usually think of microtubules of having what's called a plus end or positive end. This is the growing end and a minus end. So this is kind of like the anchor, right? So it kind of has those two. So like, for instance, if I wanted to extend this microtubule out, what I would do is I'd stack it on this end, on this plus end, and it would grow in this direction. If I wanted to take it all apart, I would basically take it all apart from the same end, okay? So you can kind of extend it out or you can retract it from this positive end. Um, and uh, that's basically your microtubule. So fairly large, um, but you can see there's different microtubules kind of scattered throughout um, the cell itself. And then of course you have your intermediate filaments, which are basically somewhere between seven and 25. In this particular one, you have an intermediate filament that's around 10-ish or so. Um, and you can see kind of forms little cables. So if you kind of take a close up look at these, you can see there's like individual like little fibers, like little fibrous proteins that they're kind of wound together. So sort of braided together into these larger sort of what's called fascicles, which then kind of forms the overall cable, right? It's like a cable of cables, it's like a suspension bridge cable. Um, and so this then you can see, and this is really why I like this image because it really drives home how intermediate filaments look. So here you can see all these ribs of intermediate filaments, but it kind of forms a sort of scaffolding. You notice that the intermediate filaments are really what's sort of creating this sort of upheld tent. So it's like the frame of the tent that's holding the cell up and open. Um, not only that, but you can also see that the intermediate filament is also attached to various organelles. So you can actually tether and anchor your organelles to the intermediate filament so that they're not just floating all over the place or just sort of you know oozing everywhere, right? They're kind of got a stable location. And the reason why they have a stable location is because you've got them tethered to your intermediate filament actin skeleton, uh, excuse me, your intermediate filament uh, cytoskeleton. And so this is, that's the reason why I really like this one. I mean, microtubules are what they are, actin filaments are what they are, but this is probably one of the best pictures that I've seen in any textbook actually of showing you exactly how these intermediate filaments sort of are arranged and laid out and kind of how they create that big scaffolding pattern that uh, sort of forms the support structure for the cell itself. So what we want to do now is we want to talk a little bit about microtubules um, and, um, and we'll kind of go back and forth between microtubules and, and a little bit of actin, but most of our discussion in the actin cytoskeleton, the cytoskeleton is going to be um, about microtubules. Uh, because that's just uh, does a lot of work on the things that we love the best, right? Uh, things that we're most interested in. Um, it's involved in those processes. Um, and we'll have a little bit to say about actin, um, but a lot of it's going to be about microtubules. So first of all, let's start off with the first obvious question. So I get that all I have to do is stack tubulin dimers in order to get my cylinder. I got that. But the question is, where do you start, right? Hmm. 
not only where do you start, but how do you determine where you start, right? Do I start at the nucleus and work out? Do I start at the periphery of the cell and work in? Do I start somewhere in the middle and work in both directions? So how do I actually manage to do this? Because there's a lot of options. Don't necessarily know if there's any wrong answers, but there's gonna be a lot of different outcomes depending on which one I choose. So the question is, where do I start? Well, as the good, the good thing is we've got an organelle, at least in animals, that will solve that problem for us. And it's called the centrosome. So the centrosome is uh, basically what we refer to as a microtubule organizing center. As a matter of fact, um, the centrosome is a type of MOC, right? And this is a very generic term, right? So it's just a center in the cell that organizes your microtubules. It's your start point. Now, a centrosome is an MOC, but not all MOCs are centrosomes. That make sense? And there's a reason why we, we state this, we mention this, <clears throat> because centrosomes basically exist in animal cells, but not in plant cells. So the question is then, well, what about plants, right? I mean, don't they move stuff around? Um, well, yeah, they do, right? But how do they do that if they don't have microtubules? Well, they, they do have microtubules. What they don't have is a centrosome. They have some other type of, of uh, organizing center that's different than a centrosome. Now, a centrosome has two structures in it called centrioles. And basically, they're, the centrioles are arranged in perpendicular, like little perpendicular drums they kind of are turned perpendicular to each other like this. So this is a centriole. And this whole thing is a centrosome. Now, as it turns out, what this perpendicular drum is made out of is microtubules. So basically what you have is, is like this little, like these little circles of microtubules in there. And then what this allows you to be able to do is grow out your microtubules by just stacking your tubulin on these little starter drums. And because they're perpendicular, you can basically grow your microtubules out in just about any direction you want. So that's the reason why they call it a microtubule organizing center is because it's like a little nucleation point that allows you to have a bit of a foundation to start stacking your tubulin onto. Now, this is what plants don't have. Plants don't have that little star-like structure up there in the, in the top. Okay. So now they do have a microtubule organizing center. They have to because they do organize their microtubules, but it's just not a centrosome. It's just not the same way that animals do it. As a matter of fact, I've actually seen some textbooks, and I think they've largely written this out in later editions of the correction, but I've actually seen some textbooks, and, and the textbooks I saw it in were for like, lower biology students were like the non-majors type of a situation but I actually saw a textbook basically say that you know when it comes to centrosomes one of the most the, one of the biggest questions in a, in a chapter like this is what is it what does it do right so for instance what is this what is this organelle and what does it do right those are the big ones well when it came to the centrosomes you would ask them what is it and of course students would be like it's a centrosome and then the book would say what does it do and it would say like well we don't know its function I'm like um that's actually not true we actually do know its function. We know it actually quite well. It's a microtubule organizing center. Their point was that we don't know how plants do it. So, because plants don't have a centrosome, therefore we don't know what a centrosome does. That's not true. We know what it does because we know exactly what it does in animal cells. Now, what we don't know is how plants do it in the absence of a centrosome. That doesn't mean we don't understand centrosomes. That means we don't understand the MOC in plants. That's a different thing. Is that a question going on, Kelsey? Oh, no. 
or just trying to yeah, just discern my hieroglyphics. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit. Or my Sanskrit. It's actually more like Sanskrit. Have you ever seen Sanskrit? Yeah, that's me. Um, right. So that's uh, that's basically an important one, right? Because it's our our microtube organizing center. But this is basically what it looks like. So here's our central. So here's our two perpendicular drums. These are our two centrioles. Notice what they look like. So they're basically not one, not two, but three microtubules that are sort of bound together as, as kind of a as kind of a cohesive whole, like that as a triplet, right? And then you have this nine of these triplets, but it's around a hollow core. So you said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. Okay. So that's an important structure because what that basically means is because you've got three of them, you've got all kinds of capacity to build off this, right? You don't have to build a microtubule off of all of them. You can just pick one, or you can pick two, or you can pick all three, right? And you can do that same thing with all of them or just with a couple of them and a few of them. So you can really have a lot of um, plasticity in terms of how you're basically going to pull this off. So you can see that you can kind of create this huge microtubule network. And once this is actually going, these can actually get quite extensive. And eventually what can happen is they can basically cover the entirety of the cell because they just keep on going. So they're just like everywhere. So you can see you can kind of lay down microtubules like all over the place just from these two centrioles. Okay. Remember that nine triplets around a hollow core. Because we're going to see that structure again a little later on. So the other thing we want to take a look at then is cell movement, right? So remember we said that uh, cytoskeleton is also support, but it's also locomotion, right? We talked about a couple of different types of movement. Um, we talked about crawling, and, uh, and then we're also gonna talk about the movement of the flagellum. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about both of these. So first of all, before we move into this bottom half, what I want to do is I want to sort of take a look at the top half and finish that off so that when we start moving toward the flagella and cilia um, construction, the construction of the eukaryotic flagellum, for which we already have a comparison, right? Because we already have in our head the prokaryotic flagellum, what that one looks like. Now we're going to compare it to the structure of the eukaryotic flagellum. Um, but before we do that, because that's a microtubule discussion, and pretty much once we start talking about that, it's all microtubules from here on out. What I want to do is I want to clean up this last little bit of actin discussion and to unpack this concept of crawling, this kind of small sort of local movement of a cell. And I want to explain this um, by going over amoeboid movements. Now, the reason why this is important is because not only do individual protists do this, amoeba, for instance, obviously, um, will do this type of movement, but this is also the way that a lot of your white blood cells will move. Um, so macrophages and phagocytic cells, white blood cells that sort of patrol your tissues, looking for bacteria that may have entered through a cut or something of that nature. The way they enter into your tissues is through amoeboid movement. So a lot of your white blood cells are actually doing exactly the same thing. And so it's important to understand that mechanism so you can understand fundamentally how these things are moving, especially for those of you moving on the AMP, right? So act shocked when you get there. Actually don't, but um, 
So this is how it looks. We're going to take an amoeba. There's your nucleus. Um, now, in an amoeba, the way it moves is by oozing, right? So when you take a look at a cell, there's actually two different reservoirs of actin just below the cell membrane, right around in this area right here, you're gonna see a kind of a scaffoldish like area of solid actin. See, I'm gonna to to draw X's. And this is what's called cortical actin. And it's solid in nature. So it's like a solid matrix. Okay. Now, in addition to this, in a lot of cells, there's also going to be inside this kind of reservoir a fluid with actin fibers in it floating around. This is like a fluid actin, kind of like a gel consistency. Okay. Now let's imagine, yeah. What is the first thing? The cortical? cortical? Yeah, it's at the cortex. Right, so this, so you have two different types. It's like uh, they talk, call it gel salt, solid gel, so gel salt interactions. But let's imagine that this little piece right here, as an amoeba, what you wanted to do is you wanted to move in this direction. So the way that you would do that is um, you would basically start by breaking down your cortical actin. And then what you would do is you'd push your gel fluid like actin against that open membrane. When you do that, what's gonna happen? It's gonna bulge it out. And you're gonna have all this fluid like actin pushing that little bulge outward. This is what's referred to as a pseudopod, which means false foot. And then what's gonna happen is you're gonna anchor that little pseudopod to wherever you wanna go. And then you're going to pull the rest of your body in that direction, okay? Now, how do you actually anchor that and like make sure it doesn't just flow right back in? Well, it's very easy. What you do is once you anchor it, then you basically rebuild your cortical actin. And that keeps your foot right there. And if you want to bruise the rest of your body, you break down your cortical actin so that you can ooze on over. And then you rebuild your cortical actin to make sure that you don't lose it. So every time you want to sort of ooze in a direction, you break down your cortical actin, you push your fluid actin against that membrane and it basically bulges out like you're squeezing a water balloon, right? And that's basically how amoeboid movement works. <clears throat> This is the crawling mechanism. So like I said, very small local distances. These aren't very, I mean, you're not talking about flowing from head to toe here. You're talking about very small microscopic distances. So it's a small scale movement. So that's the amoeboid stuff. And that's all basically actin. That's your actin, the dynamic nature of your actin cytoskeleton, building it up, breaking it down, building it up, breaking it down. So your amoeba and your white blood cells are very dynamic when it comes to your actin. Now, unless you're doing that type of motion, good. So unless you're doing that type of motion, then you don't necessarily have the same needs for that dynamic interplay, right? So it depends on what you're looking at. So that's kind of the, the functions of the actin filament and the crawling mechanism. Now, what about moving in large distances, right? So this is basically movement across small distances.
What about movement over large distances? Well, that's what this next piece is. So you're solving that problem. So if you need to get somewhere, obviously self crawling is not gonna do it for you. Right, it's just too small. So what do you do? You gotta rig up an outboard motor, right? You gotta put an engine in there. And that's where we get to flagella and cilia. So flagella and cilia have the same structure. They have the same microtubule arrangement. It's called the nine plus two arrangement. But the way they differ is in size, that's it. So a flagellum is going to be a long whip. Cilia, on the other hand, are going to be usually more bountiful, but they're going to be short, like little short hairs. Okay. Um, and so they tend to sort of have a slightly different set of mechanics than the prokaryotic flagellum. But before we get there, we have to talk about a couple of things in order to understand flagellar motion that we're trying to build. So in order to build the basis for flagellar motion, we have to talk a little bit about motors, right? And in particular, motor proteins. So motor proteins are a class of proteins that do exactly what we say they do. They are motors, right? And typically most motor proteins will have a common set of domains to them, right? So they will have what's called down here, a walking domain. That requires ATP, so you need energy for that. And then they have a cargo binding domain where you actually bind the cargo. So if they've got a walking domain that requires ATP, then what is it that they're walking on? Well, it's very simple. They're walking on the microtubule. Think about it this way. We have a perfect analogy in your commute to campus today. What led you to campus? Roads, so what would roads be in this system? The microtubules. As a matter of fact, the way we have the city laid out is that anywhere in the city that a person would want to go, we have a road leading there, right? Now, what happens if there's a particular road leading somewhere that nobody wants to go anymore? What are we going to do with that road? Eventually, it'll start to fall apart, right? We will grow over it. And then what do we do? We'll just tear it up, right? Because we got other places to go. If nobody's going there anymore, then why waste the money trying to maintain it? We're just going to let it go, and we're going to tear it up and let the cows take it over again, right? Same thing true for the microtubule. Anywhere in the cell you want to go, you have to lay down a microtubule to get there. So microtubules are roads. Oh, but wait a minute. For some of you, a road didn't get you here at all, did it? For some of you, it was a set of train tracks. Well, guess what? Microtubules are the train tracks. As a matter of fact, that's true for anything, right? Regardless of where you want to go, there is something, a road, a track, or something that leads you there. Okay, that's the microtubule. However, whether we use a road or a train, we have basically the equivalent of a motor protein, don't we? So let's use the road scenario. What's your motor protein? What are the components of a motor protein? So you've got a walking domain, right? It's kind of the motor domain. And you got a cargo binding domain. So what is that? If you got here by roads, what's our motor protein? It's a car, right? And then where is the motor domain of the car? Or the walking domain, if you will? Huh? The, well, the dining is the protein. I'm talking about the car. Yeah. <laughs> so you're getting technical. So you're, yes, you're right, right? So in this case, like, 
for, for the car itself, the wheels, right? Because the wheels are what's connected to the road, just like the walking domain of the dining in this case is connected to the, the microtubule, right? So that's what's getting you there. And of course you need energy to get here, don't you? What do you need to fill your car with? And yes, you're right. right? That's probably the one that most people don't think of, right? You're like, you're like picking up all the good ones. Uh, Right, so gas and electricity, right? Energy, both are energy, right? Because let's face it, we all know that if you don't have electricity in your car, how far are you gonna get, right? Just ask those who have a dead alternator. You're not going anywhere if you don't have electricity in your car, right? So you need both, but both of them are forms of energy. You need energy to walk along the road, right? Just like the dining needs energy, ATP, in order to walk along the microtubule. Oh, but wait, there's also a cargo binding domain, isn't there? Where's that in the car? Well, I guess if you put a dead body in there. <laughs> the, the cabin, right? This where we sit, right? That's the cargo binding domain. I mean, it's there and it's comfortable, not because the car needs it. Functionally, it's because that's the space that we like, right? So the inside of the car is designed to appeal to us. So that would be like the cargo binding domain. And we basically bind ourselves to the cargo binding domain. And then the walking domain through the behest of energy moves down the road to where we wanna go. Oh, by the way, you train people, same thing. Right. What's your motor protein? So what's well, a train? The train car, right? So what would the walking domain of the train car be? Yeah, it would just be the this, this the, the little. I don't know if that have wheels necessarily, but they kind of got these weird sort of like little glider things with like whatever. I don't know what, how that. It's not like a normal wheel, but. But it's whatever's connecting it to the track, right? That's your walking domain, right? Um, how about your cargo binding domain? Yeah, it's the inside of the, the train cabin, right? That's basically binding us. And then of course, how about your energy? Uh, yeah, for, uh, for, this, for the motor protein, it's ATP, right? For the train, it is. For the, well, for the, for a, uh, for a, uh, um, uh, for the light rail, I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Train, light rail, all the same to me. Right. But you're right. Maybe it would be like, it would be like, you know, coal for like a fire burning. That'd be like a steam engine. Same, same idea, right? Where's the energy coming for, for light rail? For those of you got here by light rail. The electricity, right? So the overhead connectors, right? That's all electricity. So electricity basically powers the walking domain, which moves it down predetermined tracks, carrying cargo, just like your motor proteins are energized by ATP, walking down predetermined microtubular tracks, carrying cargo, right? And of course, this cargo could be a vesicle. So this kind of puts a little bit of a different shade on it now, doesn't it? Remember when we talked about endomemory system, we talked about the transport vesicles moving from the rough ER to the Golgi. Without saying anything, it's easy to sort of fill in the blanks to assume, oh, well, it probably just sort of drifts over there, right? How many of you guys are thinking of drifting techniques, right? That's probably most likely what you would go to because that makes the most sense. It's a short distance, why not, right? And that's actually, by the way, you're in good stand because that's what we used to think before we actually studied microtubules. We used to think that the vesicles would move around the cell by random drift. But what we realized is that nothing in the cell is random. Nothing in the cell is random. Even when it appears to be random, it's not random. It's like intentional randomization. It's like there is like more intention in a cell than there is in most people's lives. Um, I mean, it is like airtight intention. No, those vesicles are moving along little microtubules. It, what we don't see 
in those electron micrographs is the little motor protein underneath that vesicle, walking it along a microtubular track on its way to the cis face of the Golgi. Everything in the cell is intentional. Nothing is left to chance. You know why? Because nothing good comes from chance. Right? I mean, think about it. That's why I'm not interested in games of chance. Nothing good comes from it. No. No, because usually in order to get the big win, you've had you had to have lost many, many times beforehand. Um, and generally speaking, you may never get that big win. So all you just basically do is walk out of the casino a loser. You might break even. I know, right? So you might get lucky if you break even. If you break even, that's a good day. Call it quits. Don't be stupid, right? Go buy lunch. At least then you get something for your payment, right? You lose money, but you get something in return. Um, that's I'm. I've never really understood gambling. I just have no idea what the appeal is to it. It's like, um, okay, so whatever. Just, I guess, a different way of looking at it. Different things get different people's motors going. No, that wouldn't even do it. No, because, I mean, to me, it's like getting money is like more satisfying. It's like when it's like you kind of, thought your way into it. It's like, okay, I kind of figured out how to get this $6,000. That's the satisfying part about $6,000. I can get the $6,000 anytime I want. I just go rob a bank, right? But there's no interest in that. I mean, it's much more interesting to sort of play that sort of life chess game to try to figure out. It's like, ooh, I just figured out a way to win $6,000 from your life, right? That's more fascinating and fun and satisfying than just dumb lucking it into $6,000 and just hoping you do that again. Um, so that's, that's why I never really, yeah, if you learn how to cheat, right? Yeah. Go rain man on the situation and you'll be like, okay, yeah. Then you get yourself thrown out, but you might get comped, but then yeah, at that point. So yeah, it's, uh, at that point, I'm like, if I'm working that hard at it, why don't I just do something productive with myself? Right. Like, like go hold down a job. Right. I mean, at that point, if I'm using that much brain power, I would make more money holding down a job. Than I would be trying to gaming game the game system. I mean that's just what? Mm. Can't know right. I could afford that Bentley, right? So if I get good at that one, I'd be like, yeah. But let's face it, right? Somebody takes a look at okay, you're like a community college professor and you drive a Bentley. Yeah, like that's not going to be obvious. I don't know. But it's the yeah. yeah, I know, right? They're like, um, hmm. okay, you're going to jail. Because I wouldn't be like devious enough to cover my tracks well. I'd be like, you know, I just don't, I just don't have. Uh, yeah, money laundering, right? There's money laundering services are there for a reason. Exactly. Right. Just got to go talk to Vinny. Anyway, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, right. So basically, motor proteins are moving everything around, and, and they're a critical part of the story, right? Because they're moving everything around the cell that you want to move. Okay. So now that we know motor proteins are a thing and dynine is a type of motor protein, there's other motor proteins that do other uh, types of tasks, by the way. Uh, we don't, they're not all the same, but dynine is the one that's, that's at play here. So now that we kind of have this motor protein concept under our belt, now we can start take a look at the structure of flagellar and cilia and see how we can get these things to move for us so that we can get locomotion. So ultimately then, um, what we have to do is we have to construct the flagellum. Now let's take a look at the structure here, first of all. So in a cell, when you're dealing with either cilia or flagella, they all start off with the same, what's called basal body. And this is kind of like the foundation, right? And if you take a cross section of the basal body, which typically is in the membrane, you notice it has a very, very reminiscent structure to it. What does the basal body look like? It is microtubules, that's true. We just saw it a few slides ago. What? It looks like the centrosome, right? That th triplets, the triplets around a hollow core. This looks very much like a centriole.
And we already know what we can do with centrioles, right? We can build entire vast microtubule networks off the of centrioles. And so you can see you got your three triplets, right? So your nine triplets, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, around a hollow core. Exactly the same structure as a centriole. So then on this basal body, then you're gonna be building your microtubule network, which becomes your flagellum. Now, if you kind of go a little further down the flagellum to where it's a little more mature and you do a cross section like this guy right here, then what you're gonna get is this nine, what's called nine plus two structure. So the nine comes from the nine doublets. That's these guys here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. The two is gonna be two microtubules in the core. So that's these guys here, one, two. Notice they're not doublets, it's not a doublet, they're separated. So there's a hub and a flagellum. As a matter of fact, when you actually take a closer look at this, you'll notice a couple of other things. Like if you look closely, they're kind of a little difficult to see, but these kind of greenish looking blobs here. So see this kind of like little green blobs right there? They're connecting the doublets to the central hub, very similar to Was that starting to look like? Spokes. So they're actually called radial spoke proteins. So what you're starting to see is a structure that's starting to look very similar to something we know well. It's starting to look a lot like a bike wheel. where you have a rim composed of your nine doublets around a hub. In this case, there's two microtubules and, oh, that's cute. Is that a new one? Oh, that's gotta be the new mascot. Sorry, that's our chair. She's like a total like border collie foster. She uses it as a cover to kidnap them, to dog nap them actually. She actually has long-term fosters that she had a couple of at home. So, but they're cute. They're always cute. Um, it, it, it took just about every bit of my strength, not just run out there and go kiss and slobber all over, but um, not, not, not Fleur, the dog. Um, but anyway, <laughs> you're like, they're like, eh, whatever. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> right, so, um, so this is basically, kind of constructed as a connected whole now, right? So everything's all connected together. Not only that, but there's one important piece of the basic physics of a bike wheel that we wanna make sure we get down very clearly. So if I take my one side of my rim, the right side of my rim, and if I were to pull down on this side of the bike tire, what's gonna happen on the other side? It's gonna go up, right? Why? because it's all interconnected, right? Because the force that I'm pulling on one side of the rim is translating through the spokes, through the hub, through the other spokes to the other side. And it's basically responding to just that one little pull that I'm doing on one side. Why? Because it's an interconnected system. So when you look at the flagellum, that's actually critical in order to understand how the flagellum moves. Now, the other thing also that we wanna make sure we see very clearly is a, more green blobs, by the way, um, but green blobs that are actually attached to the doublets. So notice these little guys right there. These little like Mickey Mouse ears. You can see there's like two of them, very distinct, two blobs on every doublet. These are dynia. Those are the motor proteins. As a matter of fact, what those are, are the little walking domains of the motor proteins. So the cargo domain of the motor protein is actually attached to the doublet and the little legs are sticking out. So what the double, what it looks like if you were to draw it, it looks something like this. So here's my doublet. And then I've got basically the little dynines kind of like sticking like this. So I got my cargo domain attached to the actual microtubule and my little walking legs sticking out like that. 
So that's actually what the, the, the doublets actually look like. But so how does this actually explain flagellar motion? Well, it's very simple. Notice how the flagellar, the, the doublets are right next to each other. So what happens, a little bit of performance art here, right? So basically what happens is, let's imagine this is one doublet, my left arm is one doublet, my right arm is the other doublet. And then of course I've got my dining sticking out either side. So what happens in order to move flagella is the first thing that happens is your flagella is straight. And then the dynings of one flagellum will attach to the other adjacent flagellum and they'll start walking, right? And then what happens is as they're walking, they can't go forward, right? Because it's, there's, they're structurally constrained that way. But what they can do is they can pull this guy down. Now, as this guy starts to pull down, he's pulling on the rest of the system, which will start to pull the other side over, right? And then once that kind of bends over, so it kind of goes from straight to over. And then when the dynies let go, it snaps back straight again, right? So it goes right back straight. And then what happens is the other dynies grab on to the adjacent, the right-hand side, and they start walking. So it pulls it the opposite direction, which bends it in the other direction to the right. And so it'll bend this way. And then they let go and it snaps back straight. So what happens is it starts to oscillate back and forth, bend, snap, bend, snap, bend, snap, bend, snap. If you speed that up, it basically is this sort of whipping structure, whipping back and forth, not like a rotary, not like a propeller that was, that was bacterial, right? But back and forth like a snake. And that's enough to create motion. Yeah. Do what? Mm -hmm. And then it'll kind of snap back and yep. Exactly, yeah. Basically you're kind of, this is the exact same motion, that little serpentine motion that uh, fish do. Yep, exactly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. No, because they're cargo binding domain, which would be attached to the cargo, the, the vesicle in this case, is attached to the microtubule instead. Exactly. Okay. But they're still trying to walk, right? It's just that you've got them stuck to the microtubule. So they're just grabbing on to the other microtubule and they're walking, they're walking it down. Okay. And the same thing is also true, like for instance, if you take a look at a flagellum, you know, there's only one flagellated cell in humans, um, and that's sperm, right? We don't have flagellated cells, but we have a lot of ciliated cells, right? So obviously if you take a look at a sperm, you have a long whip-like tail that basically will give you your sperm motility, right? So basically you kind of need that whip-like structure that kind of just kind of whipping its way um, along. With cilia, it's more like waving. It's kind of like, uh, you know, when you take a look at a kelp forest, you kind of see the kelp just sort of gently sort of waving back and forth in the current. That's kind of what cilia are doing, only they're moving a little faster, right? They're not just kind of a lazy little current sort of thing. What they're doing is, is they're not being waved around by the current, they're waving around and creating the current, right? So they're whipping back and forth in us, a good example of a ciliated tissue is in our trachea. So our respiratory system is actually lined with a type of epithelium that is ciliated and that epithelial cells actually produce mucus as well. So our respiratory tract, especially in our trachea is lined with a layer of mucus and it's ciliated as well. So what happens is, and it's that, that way for a reason, right? Because when you breathe in, if you're breathing in dust or smoke or something of that nature, you don't want particulate matter to get into the business end of your lungs, your lung tissue in, in your alveoli, because there's no defense against that in your alveoli. So like if you have dust in your alveoli, it's gonna turn into cement and that's gonna cause that alveolus eventually to fail and you're gonna start coming up with respiratory distress, right? So what happens is, as you're breathing in, the idea is that the mucus in your trachea 
sort of catches all these dust particles, they get stuck in that sticky mucus. And then the cilia will basically sweep that dusty particle laden mucus up your trap to hit your cough mechanism and you cough out this kind of phlegmy ball of debris, right? And that's what it's designed to do. It's basically clearing up and cleaning up the air that you're breathing so it's nice and clean and you're not leaving a bunch of particulate matter in your lungs, which can be deadly. It's also the reason, um, by the way, why smokers who are basically chronically assaulting the respiratory system on a regular basis uh, have that lovely smoker's cough, that crackly, half-chewed lung thing that always um, makes you sound like they're you know, one step away from death. It's because all the all smoke particles are constantly getting stuck in their mucus. And then because it's a continuous assault of smoke, the cells make more mucus in response because they're like, okay, I see we're breathing smoke for a living. Okay, I'm gonna basically create more mucus. And then it gets kind of much more phlegmy and crackly. And that's where that big, really kind of phlegmy smoker's cough comes from. Yeah, you'll, you can damage the cilia eventually. Yeah. You like the rotary system better? Uh, yeah, certainly, right? Because, I mean, if you think about it, um, Eukaryotes, we don't really do a lot of swimming, do we? I mean, we have one cell. We have one ciliated cell and we don't have to go very far. I mean, for the most part, right? I mean, you know, basically the, for the sperm to swim up the female reproductive tract is, it's not a very huge distance. Um, so not like a prokaryote, right? I mean, you have a prokaryote. I mean, they could be swimming long distances or rotating around or whatever they're doing. But for them, their locomotion is much more part of their daily existence. Like they have to move because they have to go find food, right? We don't. I mean, we do a lot to help the sperm find the egg, uh, both, right? In both the male reproductive tract and the female reproductive tract. The two reproductive tracts are designed to really help and assist the sperm to find it. So if the sperm can't find it, it's not because we didn't try, right? I mean, that's kind of, Right, so it's not that way with prokaryotes. With prokaryotes, their movement, they're trying to find stuff, it's random, nobody's helping them. They just kind of have to swim around and hope they run into something good, right? So it's very different, which is the reason why you have to have a much stronger efficiency there because it's much more, your life is dependent on it, right? Literally, so, and that's not the case with us. We can just go to McDonald's and eat, right? We don't have to spin around the campus and hope we run into a sandwich somewhere. Um, <laughs> that sounds like a Mr. Bean episode somewhere. But anyway, um, so yeah. so this is the cell wall. So let's take a look at the cell wall, right? So obviously, we talked a little bit about it. So we know that plants uh, are made of cellulose, fungi, and of course, insects are made of chitin. When we take a look at the cell wall, it's actually not just a single cell wall. There's actually a couple of layers of cell walls. There's a little bit more complexity to it than just like, aha, there's a cell wall, right? Um, so when you take a look at the cell, so here's cell number one, here's cell number two. We're gonna take a look at electron micrograph of the cell wall, two plant cells coming together. And so as you kind of go through the cytoplasm, the first thing you're gonna hit obviously is gonna be your plasma membrane. That's just basically layer right here. And then just on the other side of the plasma membrane is gonna be the first of two layers of wall. This is the secondary wall. This is the one that's the, the majority of the plant cell wall. So what we think about a plant cell wall is mostly secondary wall. And then beyond that, there's gonna be a smaller area called the primary cell wall. That's for the outer uh, side. It's kind of like an outer veneer, if you will, of the cell wall itself. And then there's a space or a gap in between plant cells. So you can see this little gap right there. That's actually a gap. That's what's called the middle lamella. And then you can see the reverse of that in the other cells. So here's your primary here, and your secondary, and then here's your plasma membrane, of course, your cytoplasm. All right, so you actually have two kind of layers to it. Um, it's not just all one layer. So there's a little bit more structure. Now, if you were into botany or actually more like plant physiology, you dig in a lot deeper into the cell wall structure, the very, the nuances of the differences of cell wall structure, how primary ver wall versus secondary wall is slightly different in terms of nuance and what that means functionally for the plant and physiologically what that does for the plant but that is like way 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 out of the scope of just general bio so for us the cell wall is made of cellulose we're happy 
um, if that's as far as you can get, then we're good for that one. Okay. Okay. Now, I also told you that uh, there's a couple of extra uh, topics at the end of this big outline. So we've reached the end of the outline. And now we're kind of into those uh, topics, important topics, by the way. The first of those is extracellular matrix. Now, exactly what is extracellular matrix? So basically, extracellular matrix is the outside of the cell. So it's the outside portion of the cell itself. So if you take a look at a cell, every cell is going to secrete various molecules of different types outside of itself. And it's going to create this kind of huge sort of matrix of different things that it puts out there. Uh, some proteins, you know, some different types of things that are out there. And this is kind of like their neighborhood, right? So they'll secrete all types of stuff like uh, collagen, for instance, which is a type of fibrous protein. This is typically a very structural protein. Um, if you want to know what pure collagen is like, grab a hold of your Achilles tendon. That's basically about as close as we get to pure collagen. Um, so it's very tough, very ropey, very fibrous. It's what you put out there when you want a lot of structure. It's like cellular rebar, right? Now, you're not just sticking it out there in empty space. It's not airspace out there. You actually have a solution. It's a mixture, a solution. And we call it this sort of very mysterious ground substance. That's an AMP term. Uh, ground substance is composed of lots of different things. Uh, there's glycoproteins, there's different types of carbohydrate protein molecules out there. Uh, hyaluronic acid is out there, right? Different sorts of things that you might see in cosmetics. Uh, hyaluronic acid, for instance, you'll see in different kinds of cosmetics as well. Uh, chondroitin sulfate, uh, that is actually in the matrix of cartilaginous cells, but that's part of the ground matrix. Uh, the scope ground substance, basically, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like a it can range from fluidy to sort of gel like consistency, but it's kind of like the fluid slash gel component upon which you add protein fibers. Okay, so it's kind of think of it sort of like the wet cement in which you put rebar. Okay, um, and that's kind of what it's like. Um, and so collagen is often a very common one that you put out there. Um, but this kind of creates a little bit of a neighborhood for the cell, right? Not of that, but different cells will have a very distinct and unique extracellular matrix. As a matter of fact, when you get into AMP1, when you start studying tissues, um, a lot of your tissue studies are actually all studies of extracellular matrix of different types of, of tissue. Um, but it can be quite protective. A lot of times I like to think of the extracellular matrix as sort of like a bird's nest. If you think about it, a good ornithologist can actually tell you what kind of bird is in the neighborhood just by looking at their nest, because every bird builds their nest a little bit differently. And it's very unique to the species, right? Like some birds are weavers. They'll take grass pieces and they'll weave them together in this really intricate little woven basket. And uh, some birds are just a train wreck, right? I mean, throw it all in a pile. yeah, they just pile it in there. They old chewing gum wrappers and stuff like that. What, what they're trying to do is they're trying to pimp out the joint to impress the ladies. That's basically what he's trying to do, right? Apparently that's a really cool thing, like an old used gum wrapper. That's apparently like, especially Robins, that's like, you know I mean? You look out, right? I mean, you're gonna have to beat them off with the stick kind of a thing, apparently. Um, doesn't work so well for us, right? I mean, I've tried it before, right? Just here's an old gun, chewing gum wrapper, huh? Huh? Right? That's a, doesn't work so, so well. Don't try that, by the way. Um, it'll just get you pepper sprayed. Um, <laughs> I still have the eyesight to prove that. But anyway, <laughs> just kidding. I've never actually done that before, but, <laughs> but I could totally like just see myself doing it just to see what the reaction would be just for kicks. And you're like, hmm, let's see what you're going to do. Let's see how badly you're going to hurt me, right? Let's see so, how <laughs> test the science. Yeah, right, right, right. So then they come back, right, with a black eye and yeah, like, it, or Mary's like, well, that didn't go the way I wanted it to. And it's like, there's a kid on the way. Anyway, but, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. So, biology one, um, me zero. But anyway, 
Um, right, so basically this is kind of like a protective thing. And so each cell will have a very unique way of sort of laying down its extracellular matrix. And it's reflective of that cell itself, right? So this is the reason why extracellular matrix is really important is because you can tell a lot about what the cell is doing and kind of where they are functionally and, and kind of their role and what they're, what they're up to, and what their priorities are in a lot of ways by looking at their extracellular matrix. Okay. Now, one of the things in, in this particular situation, the reason why this kind of works with the cytoskeleton is because the extracellular matrix can also, among other things, um, they can also be tied to your cytoskeleton in a way that sort of stabilizes structurally your cell. Now, here's the worst thing that can happen to you as a cell, that you're just sort of free floating around disconnected from any other cell. That's really a fate worse than death, right? Most of your cells, especially for, you, for us, multicellular organisms, our cells are designed to be fastened together. They're fast, they work together, right? They're like a collective. And so for them to be separated from each other is bad news. And so, right, so, except for red blood cells. Red blood cells are a little bit different, but even then they're still kind of connected to each other through the fluid connective tissue that is the blood, right? That's technically connective tissue. So they're still kind of connected only a little more loosely, right? But the idea here is that a cell can use its extracellular matrix to anchor itself, to give itself some position, some, some stability so that it kind of knows what to expect, right? It's kind of like, I want to be able to wake up every morning in the same place so that I know how to sew together one day to the next, to the next, to the next, right? And so it can do this with the extracellular matrix by um, uh, putting out there several proteins, one of which is called an integrin and link it basically to the extracellular matrix. We'll take a look at how this looks. So here's what it looks like to anchor your cell. So here's a cell. On the inside of the cell, you have your cortical actin, right? This is your cortical actin. And then to that, you basically have, what? <laughs> so basically, yeah, it's like, whoa. Um, so to that then you have a protein that is embedded in the membrane. So you can see it goes all the way through the membrane. On one side, it is anchored to the cortical actin. That's your cytoskeleton. Now on the other side, you have an anchorage to the extracellular matrix. This is a cell. So this is your lipid membrane. No, the, like, a, like an animal cell. Uh, plant cells don't have extracellular matrix. Um, only animal cells do. And then this here is gonna be your extracellular matrix on the outside. Notice the extra matrix is basically what was created by the cell itself. So notice what you have up here. You have some collagen fibers. That's this big guy right here, right? That's that tough cable-like connective, right? That really tough stuff that, that makes your, your, um, your uh, extra matrix very tough. You also have some elastin. This one's for flexibility. So what gives your connective tissue flexibility is elastin. So the more elastin you have, the more flexible it is. The more collagen you have, the more tough it is. You don't get both. You get one or the other, right? This is another one of those trade-off scenarios, right? So if you want to be tough, you got to let go of the flexibility. You want to be flexible, you're not going to be tough, right? Just like you're not going to be both bulky and strong and agile at the same time, right? So agility is not going to be your thing if you're bench pressing a thousand pounds. Right. It's like, that's a lot, but um, it's like half a car. But anyway, um, so then of course you have this ground substance stuff, right? These are these little proteoglycans, these little carbohydrate protein pieces that is associated with ground substance. But now notice what you do. You have the outside of this integrin, that's the name of this protein, but then you have another protein called fibronectin. And what it does is it basically tethers and anchors to the integrin and then anchors to your collagen, the tough one. So what does that do? So what that does is it has the effect of anchoring the cell in space, in three-dimensional space. 
You lay down an exhaling matrix, which gives you a little bit of stability. And then what you do is you literally grab onto that exhaling matrix and you anchor it to your skeleton. It's the exact same thing that I'm doing when I steady myself by grabbing onto the wall. Now, if I actually built this building, I could say, well, I actually built this wall. This is my wall. This is my collagen. I actually built this. I put this here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this wall to stabilize myself. So when I start to get a little woozy, right, what do I do? I tether my skeleton by way of my fibronectin and my integrin, and I grab onto my structural external so I can stabilize myself. That way, I know I'm not going down, right? That's exactly what the cell is doing. It's basically anchoring itself, its cytoskeleton to the outside by way of this connection system, okay? So that's its connectivity. So last topic of the chapter, finally the end of four. Oh, trust me, five's longer actually. But anyway, um, is that encouraging? Yes. <laughs> You're like, yes. It gets longer and longer as the semester goes on, um, especially after spring break, right? Because, well, it's just spring break. Actually, after this weekend, because it's time change and we're going to start getting really squirrely because it's like, I just went out, right? That's, I'm the same way. So I'm right behind you. So you're out the door. I'm like, okay, but wait for me, right? So I'm just, I'm right there. Um, so let's take a look at cell connections where we already said that cells want to connect to each other, that they connect to each other. Uh, in tissues, right? So that's what's happening with us in multicellular organisms. That's what we do. So how do they connect to each other? Well, it depends on what you want to do. By the way, you got another trade-off system coming, right? Have you, have you noticed a trend? Structurally, there's a lot of scenarios where you have a trade-off, where you can get one, but not the other, right? So when you grab for one, you let go of the other. There's a lot of those. And, uh, and the, the cell loves those things, by the way. Um, okay, so let's take a look at some cell connections. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so um, first of all, when you take a look at cell connections, you have, to, you have to take a look at different types of what's called surface proteins, right? These sort of proteins that basically are at the surface of the cell, like we saw with integrin, right? That's the surface of the cell. And they have, a, they have different functions. So integrin we saw, right? Integrin's job is to sort of stabilize and anchor the cell to the extracellular matrix. We saw that one. But there's also other types of proteins out there. We have glycolipids and glycoproteins that are out there. And both of these actually help cells to sort themselves out. So for instance, if you're a liver cell, how do you know that you're not going to be connecting to a skin cell, right? That's a, good, that's a good question. Well, the reason is because your liver cells have glycoproteins on them that say liver across their forehead. So when you read their name tag, it's like, oh, I see you got the glycoproteins for a liver cell. I, I'm a liver cell too. So why don't we connect and start forming liver tissue? Right, so you, this, these glycoproteins and glycolipids help these cells sort of sort themselves out by reading each other. The MHC proteins is probably the most e extreme example of that identification, that extreme reading of cell identity, because the MHC um, proteins are basically, this is your self tag. Uh, MHC stands for a major histocompatibility complex. This is your self tag. Don't worry, I'm never gonna have make you spell that out or say that out. So I always say MHC. I usually bought the actual full thing a few times before I actually just give up and say MHC. Right, so every single cell in your body has this MHC and it has a unique MHC complex that's unique to you. You have your own self tag on every single cell in your body. It's basically what tells your immune system who belongs in your body. That you know, okay, this these are marked cells because all of my cells have my name tag on. Okay, so that's how your body determines what belongs in your body versus what doesn't. And so it's an extreme version of that. That's by the way the reason why you reject organ transplants is because I've got Bob's liver 
with Bob's name tags on his liver in my body. So my immune system attacks. It's like, wait, wait, wait. That doesn't say Mark. That says Bob. I could care less if this is saving your life. It doesn't belong in here, right? So I'm going to kill it. That's what rejection is. That's what tissue rejection is. So when you take a look then at cell-cell connections, once you actually find each other and you start to get to the place where you have to connect yourselves together, there's several different types of connections that you can make. So you have, you have what's called uh, tight junctions, you have a series of adhesive junctions, and you have some what's called communications junctions. So you have these three. Let's start off first of all with the adhesive junctions. So the adhesive junctions um, are basically a type of junction that will <clears throat> attach two cells together, kind of like buttons. And there's different types. So you have adherins, uh, you have desmosomes, and you have hemidesmosomes. So these are all different types of adhesive junctions. This is just one type of a, what's called a cadherin type of a junction. So here you have the same structure, right? So notice you have a, a block of proteins attached to your cortical actin, right? That's your cytoskeleton. And then you have a receptor that reaches outside of yourself that binds with an adjacent receptor from another cell. So it's literally like a handshake. The two cells basically will grab onto each other and lock on with similar structures. In this case, these are <clears throat> these uh, kind of what's called cadherins, calcium dependent. That's what cadherin means. Um, these are calcium dependent, but they lock onto each other. They're like train hitches, hitching two train cars together. Okay. And, but they're loose, right? So you basically have some free space in here. Why? So that molecules can, whoops, did that wrong, can basically dump out of here secretion style and can move around in there. So you have some room for some communication. So what's the trade-off in cell junctions? The trade-off <clears throat> is connection, right? The tightness of the connection, structure of the connection versus communication. So in this case, you have a little bit of free space in there. So you do have some structure because they're battened together, but you still have a little free space in there. So you're able to get a little bit of communication in there too. You're able to sort of squirt some molecules through there. Those are, there's lots of different types of adhesives. That's probably the most common type of connection that we see actually in cells. So what about the other two? Yep. So now the other two, now remember, when I say that these connect together like buttons, it's an analogy that I'm using there, right? Because if I use two pieces of fabric, like my shirt, there's different ways that I can connect these two pieces of fabric, right? The way that my shirt is connected is with buttons. What that means is, even though the shirt is well connected together, not a problem, right? There's still open space in between the actual connection points, the faceting points. So if I wanted to reach in, like if there's a coat with buttons and you want to reach in an interior pocket, I could, right? Because there's like a little open space there where I can reach in there and, you know, whatever, right? Something in there, there's an internal pocket, whatever. But I can do that. So that kind of gives me a little bit of structure, right? So I'm connected together pretty well, but I also have a little bit of freedom in there. By the way, this, the button idea is really good. Like for instance, on a hot summer day, there's enough little room in between buttons to where I can get maybe a little bit of a breeze going in there. Maybe so it's kind of like I can wear long sleeves and not die because I got a little bit of open space or some free space to get some air in there so that I can like not completely overheat, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, what about the other two? How about tights? So tight junctions are basically a situation where you want just a per impermeable sheet, no leakage. So they are tight for a reason. So this basically looks like two membranes like this with two proteins that are literally fastened together like that. Notice not a lot of frills. It's just about as tight as you can get. So this one I like to think of as a zipper. What happens if I took this shirt and instead of buttons, I put a zipper in there? Would that be a much tighter connection? Yeah, matter of fact, on a cold winter's day, usually you go for 
the zipper. Why? Because you don't want that cold Arctic breeze blowing through the spaces in between the buttons and freezing you to death, right? So what do you do? You zip it up, you get a tight junction, no leakage, no permeability, no passage in between those two. So they're very tightly connected together. But notice what you've done. Here you've maximized your structure, but what have you given up on? Communication. So there's nothing getting in there. There's no space in there at all. So if I had a coat and it was zipped up and I've got an internal pocket, am I gonna to get to that pocket? No, why? Because there's no room, right? But what have I done? I've said, listen, you know what? It's really cold out here. The wind is really brisk. So I know that I'm going to lose my contact with whatever's on the inside pocket. But I'm doing that intentionally because I want to stay warm. I want, and it's more important for me to block out the wind than it is to reach whatever it is that I have on the inside of my pocket. Okay. So I've made a decision there, haven't I? I made a trade-off. I've gone one direction, but I've let the other one go. Same thing's true here. This is the opposite direction. And then of course, the last one are the communicating junctions. Now communicating junctions, um, there's two different types. There's gap junctions, this is in animals. And there's plasma asmata. This is actually in plants. So what exactly is, are these communicating junctions? Well, basically they're all, they're both of them are constructed the same. So gap junctions and plasma asmata are also very similar to gap junctions. This is just that they're in plants. So this is what a gap junction looks like. So let's say for instance, I have cell number one, and then I've got cell number two. And so this is the cytoplasm of one versus two. So gap junctions basically are like little channels that basically connect the cytoplasm of one cell to the cytoplasm of the second. It's like a sieve. So what happens then is any change that happens in cell number one will immediately ripple through the gap junctions and immediately be experienced by cell number two. Exactly, they're highly communicative, right? So this is helpful for when you need coordinated response. Not so much muscles. No, you're right. But which muscle? Yes. Right. Remember, unlike most muscles, the heart has to contract in unison. Your skeletal muscles don't contract in unison. They contract in waves, and they just it's just like rolling waves. In your heart, you have to contract all at once. That is to say, every single cell in your heart has to hear the contraction signal and they all have to respond to it at the same time in unison to get that strong unified contraction, which is gonna pump the blood out to your body. That's kind of like me saying, okay, on the count of three, everybody in the room, jump. Well, if we're all gonna be coordinated, we all have to hear the countdown at the same time, right? That's only gonna happen if you're all interconnected to the same airspace. If I do it by grapevine, Okay, Evan, on the count of three, jump. One, two, three, and pass it on, right? Then he's gonna jump, right? And then Antonio's gonna jump, and then, right? So you're just gonna keep on, Jorge's gonna jump, and then Raphael's gonna jump, and the Shane's gonna jump. It's gonna be a wave, right? That's a quivering heart, that's death, that's arrhythmia. So that's, that's paddle territory. You, you spit on the paddles and you shock them, right? You don't really spit on them, that's not a thing. Um, <laughs> um, but that's a little more like Bugs Bunny, uh, that, that one. but. Right, so that's, that's a bad thing, right? Because you need to get all those cells to pump in unison at the same time. The only way they can do that is if they're all hearing the same message at the same time. How can they do that? If they're all interconnected with gap junctions. So as soon as one cardiomyocyte hears the message to contract, that message rifles throughout all of that interconnected system of cardiac muscle and everybody hears it at the same time and they all contract at the same time. That's the reason why it's communica uh, communication. So now what have you done? You've maximized communication, right? But what have you given up? Your structure. 
because it's not a barrier. <clears throat> so you've max, so in this case, structure is kind of like a little bit of a synonym for permeability, right? So you've given up the permeability piece of it to get maximum communication. In your quest for permeability, you've given up impermeability, right? That's kind of really what you're choosing at the end of the day is either you're going to be tightly fastened or you're gonna be very loose, but very communicative, but you're not gonna be both. By the way, communications junctions are one extreme. Tight junctions are the other extreme. In the middle, you've got an infinite number of possibilities in the adhesive junctions with varying ratios of connectedness versus communication. That's the reason why there's so many adhesive junctions and different types of adhesive junctions is because they all have slightly different ratios of connectedness versus communication. And it's appropriate for different types of tissues, right? And so um, this is kind of what it looks like. So here's your tight junctions. Uh, you can see this is basically gonna be your electron micrograph of a tight junction. You see very, very tight, no room for wiggle in there. You're not talking to each other at this point. You're locking it down. You're locking it down. You're creating a barrier. So here you can see they're very tightly tethered right here. Those are the connection points. So there's nothing getting through there. The adhesive junctions and this is actually uh, a desmosome type of adhesive junction. So you can see basically you've got like a little protein pad on one side on one cell, another protein pad on the other cell. And then you kind of got these adhesive fibers that kind of interconnect between the two cells as they reach across that intracellular space. But you have a little bit of room for wiggle in there, right? What if you need a little bit more, more room in there? Well, then you can do a hemi, which means half desmosome. So it's a more loosely structured desmosome that gives you a little bit more room in there if you need a little bit more communication there. And you can get a little tighter if you don't need that communication, right? So you can see that the adhesive junctions have this range of possibilities from more um, connected to more communicative in nature. And then, uh, and this is kind of what you can see here, is you have these little cross fibers that kind of connects them across. And then of course you have your um, communicating junctions. These are gap junctions. This, by the way, is a cross section of what's called an intercalated disc. That's what you see in cardiac muscle cells. So the ends of the cells basically are this sieve-like structure. So we're not just talking about an occasional gap. We're talking about a ton. It's like almost a wide open door basically at this point. There's so many holes in the sieve. It's a very porous and very flowing sieve-like structure. It's a very, that's an SEM by the way, if you're wondering what that is. Um, so you can see there's a lot of these little junctions. So they only give you a couple over here on the right when they kind of draw the cartoon just because they want to show you the structure of it, right? But in reality, the, this SEM of this is just showing you just how many we're talking about here. We're not just talking about a few. We're talking about, it's mostly dominated by holes. It's pretty porous, right? SEM, scanning electron micrograph. So those are your main connections, connecting. And with these connections then, the combination of tight junctions on one end communication junctions on the other ends with a, va a varied spectrum of adhesive junctions in the middle. This is basically what tethers your tissues together. The cells that form your tissues, this is what tethers them together. Then of course we have plasmidosmata, right? So our plasmidosmata are basically gap junctions that connect all your plant cells. So if you take a look at plant cell number one versus number two, you can see in this case, you have your smooth ER, right? We're back to that one again. But your smooth ER will actually kind of sort of ooze its way through this like little bridge-like structure. That's the gap junction. That's that plasmidosmata. And then it'll actually kind of enter into cell number two. So these two cells are sharing a little bit of smooth ER. That, and that kind of interconnects them. By the way, this basically interconnects all cells. So when you were looking at Elodea and you saw those individual little rectangles, 
What you didn't see, because they're too tiny to see, was all the plasma osmata that are interconnecting all those cells together. So this is one of the reasons why, and you may, some of you guys may have wondered this, right? Because when you added the salt to the Elodea, you may have wondered, like, well, how does the middle cells, how are they like able to shrivel up, right? Because the salt is on the periphery. So how are they able to get it? Or cells that are buried deep in the tissue, right? How are they able to get to it? Well, the way they're able to get to it is because the salt starts to affect the outer cells. And because of the interconnected, all of all those interconnectedness of all those cells through plasma osmata, it starts to spread through all the other cells. So you can see on the periphery, they got it much harder. But you can see slowly over time, it kind of marched inward as the salt slowly kind of started sucking water out of the plant overall. Because as it sucks water out of the peripheral cells, the water from the internal cells will start to move and balance it out. And it'll kind of start to move and balance it out. And basically, the water will continue to sort of suck out of the entire plant. And then you'll start to get plasmolysis throughout the entire tissue. And that's actually critical because when you actually take a look at plant physiology, one of the ways that a plant, like a tree, for instance, we already talked about the big 200 foot tall redwood. One of the ways that it can have viable living tissue way up on the crown of the tree is because it's interconnected with all of the cells ultimately that get down to the roots, making the tree more of like a dynamic whole as opposed to just like isolated parts that are disconnected from each other. So there's a lot more integration when you take a look at an individual plant because of this interconnectedness of those cell walls, which makes plant physiology. Now I'm not a botanist by any stretch of the imagination, but at UC Davis, one of my favorite classes next to my Mozart class and my science classes is I really did enjoy plant physiology. It was hard as all get out. Um, trust me, human physiology is a cakewalk. Plant physiology is tough. <laughs> okay. But you know what? It was, yeah, they, they beat us by a lot, right? So um, in a lot of ways, actually. But it was a fascinating sort of a thing because plants are much more integrated than we give them credit for. And they're much smarter than we are when they don't have actually a nervous system, which is humbling at best. Okay, so there's that one. And we're just about our witching hour. So what do we say we start five next time? By the way, just to remind you, Friday, don't show up. It's case study day. Where we talked about that one on Monday, but because we are on track and our next lab is mitosis, mitosis isn't until next week. So this is a case study day. And since I don't do case studies, this is the wild card week where um, sections that got snowed out on their lab day, this is their week to kind of get back into sync. So like this morning, I had the fermentation photosynthesis lab with my Monday, Wednesday crew because they got snowed out one of those Wednesdays. Um, and so um, our lab is on Friday. So even though we got snowed out, it wasn't a lab day for us. So that's why we're on target. So that's the way I use case studies. So other sections will actually sit down and they'll do like a dry lab kind of a thing. I don't because I usually get snowed out like so frequently that I need that wild card day to get everybody back into sync. So our next lab, don't fall asleep on it, will be next week on mitosis. It's the day before spring break. So I would suggest, it's gonna be an easy lab. So it's not gonna be a taxing one, but you don't wanna miss this. You don't want to start your spring break early. Yeah. Yes. And it'll pick up with our retrospective on fermentation photosynthesis. We'll just roll that one forward to our retrospective. So, wait, are we doing lap 10 for Friday?